Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to St. Andrew's Church on this glorious Heritage Day as we're celebrating Her Majesty's Platinum Jubilee. Um, for those who are not aware of it, there is an excellent hearing loop here in the church. So if you have a hearing aid and want to switch it to T, you should be able to hear everything David has to say. If you don't want to hear what the vicar says, just wait until I've finished and then switch it. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to church this afternoon. Uh, I've heard little bits and pieces from David of some of the exciting discoveries that he's been making over the months as he's been trawling archives, uh, heading up to London and coming back and saying, oh, it's really fantastic, Mike, what I'm discovering, but we haven't been given full details yet. So today is the first opportunity, I think, for the public to hear of for all that David's discovered. David hardly needs an introduction as he's written so much about the history of Cobham, but I'll just introduce him as a former colleague, as church warden here of St. Andrews, and as a friend. And before David begins, I'd like to offer one of the Jubilee weekend prayers before we begin. Let us pray. O oh God, you provide for your people by your power and rule over them in love. Receive the gratitude which we offer this day for your servant Elizabeth, our Queen. Send your blessing upon her work, that under her we may be wisely governed, and all people may serve you in faith, hope, and love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So David, I'll hand over to you and uh, await the discoveries with bated breath. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Good. Well, thank you very much, Mike, and uh, thank you all for coming. I'm particularly honoured that the High Sheriff is with us, and thank you for staying on today to join us, and also for our Vice Lord Lieutenant as well, who's with us. So we, we're really honoured to have you with us again, Stephen. Thank you. But thank you all for joining us, and I hope um, you'll find uh, this of interest this afternoon. I know some people, when you start to talk about history, they sort of glaze over. I'll try to make it, you know, move as we go along. I have been told I've got to finish so people can go to the duck race, so yeah, I won't go on for too long. Um, Mike mentioned about um, uh, trawling through archives, and it is, this is what I love doing. And my wife, who's here, will tell you how amused she is that, you know, my favourite bedside reading is called um, uh, Enjoying Archives. And she says, how can you sort of, you know, enjoy archives? but my, the, the, you know, the material that you can find when you start to sift through. And just as a bit of a preamble to this, um, I, we did write a, um, or put together a new guide to the history of this church just a few years ago. It wasn't that long ago, and I helped to put that together, and it was published. Um, but since then, there have been these, well, I think they're pretty amazing discoveries. So that's what I want to do, to, to share with you this afternoon, to take you on that little bit of a journey. Now, some of this may be a little bit technical, but I'll try and, you know, keep it light anyway. Um, it's interesting, when I, I, I often um, take groups around the church here, um, U3A groups or whoever, and I always, in the past, I've always apologised that basically what you're seeing is a Victorian church, and rather dismissing it. I'm, a, I'm afraid I'm of a generation where we tended to dismiss Victorian architecture. But I have to say, following on from what you're going to hear and what I've found, I'm really proud of this mostly Victorian church because we've got some uh, super things here. So it's been a, quite an eye-opener for me, and in that sense I will apologise in future for you know, saying it's just Victorian because it, it's, it is, but also uh, there are lots of other things to look at as well. And in my sort of journey of, dis of, of, of um, searching through archives and so on, there are two aspects that have come uh, to life which is really of particular interest. And really, uh, they relate to both the beginning of the church here, and not quite, no, it's not the end, because we're still here, but the, in the Victorian period, the latter period, the last period of major building and rebuilding in the church. So it's both ends of the spectrum that I want to try and deal with um, this afternoon and just share the, some of those discoveries with you. 
Um, right, so with further ado, let's see if this all works. I've been told to point that over there. And hopefully, and it doesn't work. Uh, there we go. Right. So welcome to St. Andrews, a church at the heart of the community for 1,000 years. <laughs> oh. Right. No. We'll get there. It should appear. Oh, hang on. There we go. Right. And the strap line at the bottom, or possibly more. Because I've always said, you know, St. Andrews is about a thousand years old. What I'm hoping we're managing to do now is to push it back beyond that, to say we are at least a thousand and possibly a little bit more, more years older than that. Now, let's see how we go now. Um, right. This is an aerial view of um, St. Andrew's Church. I hope you can see that clearly. Uh, around about the 1940s. Uh, but it just shows the parish church at the centre of the old community of Church Cobham. And the parish church here really has always been at the heart of the community, both physically and spiritually. And I think this picture uh, really presents that very well. It's lovely to see all the green fields around, which sadly we've lost over the years. Now, the origins of this church, like most ancient churches, are lost in time. But what we do know is that uh, much of the building of this, the original building of this church, we owe to um, Chertsey Abbey. There was a great abbey church at, at, at Chertsey, not so far away from here. And Chertsey Abbey, um, in the seventh century was given a number of foundation grants, grants of lands, manor and so on and so forth, and Cobham was included in one of the foundation grants to Chertsey Abbey. If you go to Chertsey today, there's hardly any of it left. There's a few bits and pieces, uh, you know, walls and some underground chambers, but literally the abbey has gone. Uh, here we can see the abbey seal and uh, a map of the abbey itself and some of the surrounding grounds. But Cobham belonged to Chertsey Abbey. And from that we um, know that the uh, monks the, and the abbots of Chertsey would have come over to Cobham. Um, they, of course, would have been concerned about the land, what they're doing here, farming, but also the spiritual state of this part of, um, of Surrey. And so, no doubt, they were preaching here or there was some form of spiritual gathering. Now, if we go... Yeah. So, St. Andrew's Church, as you know, is very close to the River Mole. We know it, of course, when the river floods, uh, because it comes right up the drive. Never floods here. They knew where to build in the olden times. The church, as far as we know, has never been flooded, and we pray that it may stay so. But uh, it's very close to the river and to the old downside bridge. There's been a crossing of the river here um, for hundreds of years. And it's quite significant that the church is by a river crossing. Because what we, fee what we believe is that uh, there may have been a, perhaps a, a wayside cross, some sort of shrine, where people would have stopped and prayed before crossing this awful river mole. And we know that the, um, one of the maids of Queen Matilda lost her life crossing the River Mole at uh, Payne's Hill. So, you know, this river here was considered to be a little bit dangerous. And people would stop and pray. And it's, uh, it's not unusual then to find a church close to a river for that reason. And of course, it also links in with the fact we are St. Andrews. And we think that the dedication of St. Andrews is due to our links with the river. So this is where... Um, the church started, this is where the first church was built. Now, this is the church, more or less, as it is today. And uh, you can see there the north aisle over there, the nave where you're seated, the south aisle there, chancel behind me, and the north chapel. Um, the tower behind, and the vestry. 
Uh, and this does show, I won't go into it now, but it shows the periods of building. But in fact, some of that we're going to uh, question now. Um, but as you see, a fairly large uh, church nave with two aisles. But of course, it was never so when the church was first built. Get the next. Right, now I hope you can see those. Um, the picture at the top shows the church probably a sort of floor plan as it was when it was built. Simply a tower, a nave, and a chancel. Very small building. Um, and then a few hundred years later, what we believe is a chantry chapel was built over in the northeast corner. Now, in fact, even this now I'm doubting because of what I'm going to tell you in a moment about the tower. But we know that the oldest parts of the building, still standing, are the tower. And I think, get the next picture up. Yeah, you'll have come in um, to the church this afternoon through this beautiful Norman arch. Now, thank goodness, this arch would have been in the original wall, which is where this uh, row of pillars runs. When the Victorians enlarged the church, which I'll come on to in a moment, um, they saved that, that door. And that, in fact, they saved these medieval windows as well um, and put it, re repositioned it in the new aisle. And I love coming through that door because, you know, that's nearly a thousand years people have come through that arch to come to worship here at St. Andrews. And often when I come through, I want to put my hand on it to touch it because of that sense of continuity of history. And here is the, the you can see the door as it looks today. And over on the right, um, this is a, a, a watercolor by a man called John Hassel from the 1820s. And we'll see some more of his pictures in the church in a moment. And uh, here is Hassel's view of the tower arch, which is behind you. And again, as it looks today, very fine Norman arch. But, but, and this is where we now begin to rethink what's been going on here. If you look closely when you come into the church or if in the churchyard, look at the tower. And can you see, let's see if I can get this to work. Um, yep. Can you see how there's almost a line up along there? The, church is clear, the tower has clearly been built in at least two, if not three, stages. And I have to be honest, this is something I didn't pick up on until a few years ago. You, you, you just you don't see it. You walk past it every day and whatever, you just don't see it. But suddenly I'm where, hang on, this tower was built in a couple of stages. So what's going on here? Now, I then discovered um, a chap who's become a friend of mine, Dr. Michael Shapland, who's pioneered um, a study of church towers and written this amazing book called Anglo-Saxon Towers of Lordship. And what Michael has um, not come up with, he's proved and he's written a book about it, he's talked uh, to, to, to various societies, is that often the first church in a community was a tower nothing more than a tower, and uh, that the place of worship would actually be inside the tower. Okay, there's not much room there, but it was safe, it was secure, but it was just simply built as a tower. And now there is this new study into these Anglo-Saxon towers of lordship. So I've spoken with um, Michael Shapland, and I've spoken with others about do we have possibly one of these Anglo-Saxon towers of lordship here at Cobham. Well, we're still not absolutely certain, but there's just a hint that this tower, the lower foundations, could date from the Anglo-Saxon period, which would be really exciting. I'd like to say they were older than St. Mary's at Stoke. I hope there's nobody here from St. Mary's at Stoke. I said there are, I'm sorry. I'd like to prove that St. Andrew's is older. Uh, um, so if we look at the next picture, right. Get a little bit technical here. This is a new discovery. This um, a page with these drawings um, I found in the Surrey History Centre uh, not so long ago. Dates from, um, where have we got, 1852. Now what I want to point out to you um, is, yeah, we've got the church there before it was enlarged. But these windows, these are 
the four windows to the belfry. Three of them are very plain. That one is decorated. That is significant, believe it or not. And I think the next picture, yeah. Um, so if I could take you up into the tower, this is where you have to use your imagination now, and I'm afraid I can't take you up. It's quite dangerous, but maybe if anyone wants to go at some occasion, we'll, we'll, make, we'll make arrangements. But up in the tower, uh, below where the bells themselves are hanging, there's this curious recess in the wall, which you can just about see on here. There are these iron girders which were put up um, when to strengthen the bell, uh, the, the, the uh, hanging for the bells and the tower itself, you know, in, in the last century. But um, behind it, there is, um, yeah, this sort of curious recess, which um, I've often wondered, well, what's it there for? Well, this could be an indication of having been a place of worship in the tower. This is one of the indications that we might have one of these Anglo-Saxon or very early uh, towers of lordship. This could push our tower back a couple of hundred years more than we thought it is or was. So a little thing like that, which may not look much, but it's, to us it's very exciting. And strangely enough, I found some reports uh, in one of the local newspapers from the 1860s when the church was being restored and we'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, but the then vicar also was curious about what this represented, this sort of alcove, this niche. Uh, it didn't come through the wall there, it just simply went so far and stopped. And apparently he discussed this with fellow antiquarians in the churchyard uh, on the day of the, the, this visit by a number of people from the Surrey Archaeological Society. And sadly, um, they started to have a discussion, it's all reported in the newspaper, but time was pressing because they were all off to have a lunch at the local school. And I think food and drink, you know, a big temptation. So we don't know what conclusions they came to. But this is the start of what I think is indicating we have something special up in our tower. Now, we also, in the tower, um, we have the, um, on the right there, this is the, the west window. Um, that west window is now actually in the south side. Uh, can you see below? It's here, it's been moved. But it originally it was in, on the west side, looking out in that direction. Uh, it was moved when the clock was put in. But we know we have you know, a, a, an old window there. Now, just bear with me as we go on. Now, this is a, a view of the church, probably from about 1870. Um, and you can see uh, the, there is that window there. Now, if you go outside and look now, the church clock is there. But we've got a window up there which indicates some sort of chamber. That's why you have the windows there. And above it, the belfry with these, what appear to be Norman um, pillars and carvings. But, now, okay. So we're looking to look now at, um, this is one of the earliest um, pictures, and again, I only found this literally months ago in the Surrey History Centre. It's probably the earliest uh, picture we have of St Andrew's Church, and um, it shows uh, the north side with this north chapel, which is now our War Memorial Chapel, and it's much bigger there than it is now, because it was actually about a third of it was lost when that aisle was added. And again, I'll come on to that in just a moment. Uh, slightly later, this drawing by William Porden, 1815, showing the size of the original, let's call it a Chantry Chapel. And what's interesting here is, look, can you see these um, staircases going up? Because the church was so small, they couldn't get everyone in, so they decided to put build wooden galleries um, up at sort of first floor level throughout the church. But the only way to get into the gallery was from the outside to go up a wooden staircase. So no respecter of ancient buildings, they thought, well, we'll just push through the window and make a wooden staircase. And that's what we can see on there. Looking at the, um, 
the North Chapel. Um, here you can see a modern photograph and then one by Hassel, which shows this sort of very small enclosed space. Um, the possibly a Chantry Chapel, we can't be absolutely certain. Now, here's a, again another discovery just made a, literally a few weeks ago. Uh, a photograph of 1905, which I came across, which actually is showing a view from the altar looking through into that chapel. It shows it before this lovely um, uh, stone arch or, or decorated arch was put in, or the grill was put in when this was made into a war memorial chapel. But what is, what is interesting, um, sorry, it's not terribly clear on here, you can see um, these pews, uh, sorry, the, the choir pews before these. And these are from the Victorian Restoration. I just will come back to those in a moment because they are of significance. Um, of course, the chapel now is our War Memorial Chapel, and we have Mrs. Cobham's official War Memorial um, from the First World War, and we have a Book of Remembrance from the Second World War. So all the civic services, Remembrance Day services, are held here in the church for that reason. Now, I mentioned about the church being small. So, you know, the growing population, the beginning of the 19th century, where can we put people? We can build these galleries. And one of the suggestions, one of the plans that I found was to actually ex enlarge this north aisle and to build on this sort of really curious structure, which actually wasn't executed. But it's got like little Gothic uh, turrets on top and windows. This was one thought. Um, how can we get more people in over on that side of the church? Um, that didn't happen, but in fact what they did do in the 1820s was to um, enlarge the North Chapel, and you can see that here by this uh, long building here. This dates from about 1820. Um, it was built um, very much on the cheap, <laughs> and uh, it wasn't a very good structure, and it had to be rebuilt not long after. Um, the man responsible for building it was a man called Henry Pito, who actually was quite a well-known builder of his day, and his company responsible for building, uh, constructing Trafalgar Square and a um, number of important buildings in London. So this is the North Isle as extended in 1820. And to get people into that North Isle, um, sorry this isn't terribly clear here, but uh, they packed all these wooden pews in, box pews, and up into the gallery, and I don't know if you can see, it's not, probably not clear from where you are, but um, every, every seat has a name on it. So when you came to church, you knew where you were to sit, or not to sit. And of course, we had you know, the Lord of the Manor sitting at the front, and you know, the peasantry were at the back, and you find that the uh, boys and girls were all pushed us on one side at the back of the church. We had a gallery for the minstrels. Uh, but, you know, according to your status in the parish, according to your wealth, the closer to the front uh, you, you, you sat. And this is a view by Hassel of the interior of the church around about this period. So you can see just in the small picture what you're looking at today behind me, but that's the view as it would have been in about 1827. So you're seeing this quite a small building, but the, I say, the north aisle has been enlarged here. You've got these very strange uh, Doric, I think it's Doric pillars put in here. It was all, it was a bit jerry-built, it didn't look right, but it got people into the church, which is all they were concerned about at the time. Um, we had a, a lovely, um, uh, three-decker pulpit, just like the one at Stoke Davon, if you know it there, thrown out in a restoration tragedy. Um, but of course, the the the, the uh, worship at that time was very much centred around um, the pulpit. It was the word. This is what you came to church to hear: nice long sermons. And if you were wealthy enough and you had a big box pew with little curtains around the top, you could fall asleep and not have to listen. Uh, to the, the then vicar preaching. Uh, but it was the word, the word, the word. That was what 
people came to church for. And behind me, another of Hassel's views, we can see um, to the high altar in the little photograph uh, how plain it was in the 1820s um, because it was, well, it was of significance. There was an altar table there, but it was the word, the pulpit, that was with, that's what was important. And this is a view, believe it or not, this is, right, <laughs> this is behind me. So we're looking from where the high altar is now, underneath, not the arch behind me, because this is a Victorian one, but the chancel arch into the church. And can you see that enormous pew on the right-hand side with this little curtain? This would have been probably maybe the Coombe family, who knows, the local squire arch anyway. That would have been their pew right there, close to the pulpit, close to the altar, and this lovely little curtain at the top so you couldn't see them. So they were struggling, you know, what do we do with a church um, of, um, of, of, of this size? We can't get everyone in. So plans started to be made to enlarge the church. And we have various um, plan plans which are made over the, over the period of time. Um, and the first enlargement of the church was really on this side in the 1850s. The whole of the South Isle was constructed in the 1850s to enlarge the church. And uh, we can begin to see something of that on this plan with the, with the pews being laid out there. And yet another plan, you know, they were fiddling around trying to decide where the pew should go, where the pulpit should go. But then in 1863, and this is the really significant part of all this, um, Edward Loring, who was then the vicar, um, and the church wardens and the committee for the church decided they really had to get to grips with the problems and um, enlarge the church properly. So a resolution was passed um, to, to enlarge the church by the addition of a, a, a north aisle and to generally refurbish the church. Now this brings us, I talked earlier about the importance of the word, the preaching from the pulpit. But in the 1840s, I'm sure some of you will know, there was this swing towards the Tractarian movement. It was a movement towards more liturgy, what we might call slightly more high church, where the high altar took precedence. It was communion. It was the presence of God at the communion um, at the altar, at the communion rail. And so churches were being refigured, rebuilt, um, with the emphasis then, which is exactly what you've got now, of the, the, your view is to the high altar, because that's what you were to, were to see. And Loring was very much of this um, high church persuasion, and uh, the church committee at the time were with him, I felt this is what we need to do at St Andrews. Let's get rid of all these box views. Let's reconfigure this church. Let's make it to, to comply with Tractarian worship. And uh, again, another plans were drawn up. I'm not sure who, who drew this one up, but uh, it was one of the many plans trying to work out what to do. But eventually, this man was employed. This again is another of these um, important new discoveries um, because the, uh, the North Isle, when it was added, remember this is 1850-ish, this was added on in the 1860s and the architect was none other than George Edmund Street, a really, really significant Victorian architect who's best known for the law courts in the Strand, which you can see in the picture there. So we now can say we have that building is by George Edmund Street. And, yeah, here is this plan, which I found up in the London Metropolitan Archives. Uh, the plan for the North Isle with the rest of the church. I'm sorry if it's a little bit blurred, but his name is there in the corner. So we know it's George Edmund Street, the architect. Now, this, is, this begins to push us up the ladder in terms of church buildings and the importance of St. Andrews, perhaps more as a Victorian building than as a medieval building. And of course, if you can look over there and see it for yourself, this amazing uh, ceiling that was constructed by 
uh, GE Street. Um, it, it's one of the sort of glories of the church now, um, but very typical of Street, who was very much a, a traditionalist. Um, he liked to sort of try and keep uh, the old fabric where he could, but he would also take things down, move things around. And what he did was, we know that he constructed that north aisle, constructed that fantastic ceiling. And what you see above you, if you look up, this is the original, well, say original, this is a ceiling from the 1590s. This was never designed to be seen. It would have been like the ceiling behind me uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the chancel. Uh, it would have been boarded over, but street rather like the idea of exposing the timber. And I have to say, it's not very good timber work, but it, you know, it went with the feel of the times, exposed timber work. So this again, we can contribute to street, um, not the timbers themselves, but exposing it. Well, street didn't do things by halves. When he was employed in the church, they got him to do everything. So um, he came in here and these next pictures will show the floor is from the, the workshop of George Edmund Street. There are some of the choir pews which have survived. The, the ones in front here are 1920s, but right at the back, and I only realized this the other week looking at them again, is a George Edmund Street um, pew. So that survived. And then we have um, a pulpit and we have the font, again from the workshop of George Edmund Street. I've got to be honest, I find it a bit heavy, the pulpit, but it's very Victorian, but anyway, that's just personal taste. But, um, so he was just busy refurbishing the church. And Street, so we know Street was busy, the North Isle, refurbishing, relaying out uh, th this part of the church, providing that view to the altar. Um, I'm almost loath to say this, but the pews were put in by George Edmund Street. And there are some of us who would like to get rid of the pews. So this is going to be a big issue, isn't it, Leonard? <laughs> They're of no great workmanship, but they are um, Victorian from the workshop of George Edmund Street. Um, but having done all that, the church then thought, well, actually, that uh, South Isle uh, was looking a little bit... Um, second class, so they wanted to do that up. So they then raised the roof a little bit on the south aisle and constructed the ceiling, that wonderful wooden uh, barrel shaped ceiling you can see there. And they got in another leading architect of the 19th century, a man called Philip Webb, who was the great associate of um, William Morris, if you've heard of William Morris. Um, so Philip Webb, who had been working in Cobham, building a house up on the fair mile for one of his clients, was called in here to design and construct this wonderful ceiling. And we've got, um, there's a little letter, uh, a note from the church records there I found about instructing Webb to design the ceiling. So we've got George Edmund Street, and we've got Philip Webb. What more? Um, well, Philip Webb not only designed the ceiling there, but I found, amongst some other records, he actually designed a system of lighting for the church and the plan here shows these where these they were gas brackets were to be put and there's a design in the corner there which is a little fiddly detail of, of some of the the, the um, gas brackets and this again and very recently discovered in the london metropolitan archives this photograph um, was taken it actually in 1880 it's the earliest photograph we have of the interior of the church. If you look at it quickly, you think, well, it doesn't, it looks the same as it is now, but, but it's not, because um, there is no, um, uh, no chancel screen here, no rood screen. Um, there is no um, uh, arch into the, of course, into the North Chapel here. Um, there are, and we can see um, streets, gas lights displayed around there. So again, quite a significant, so I think, I'm, are you losing the sound here? Right. It's okay. Um, so again, we see, you know, street at work there. Um, 
And um, we, sorry, not Street, Philip Webb. Yeah, my architects muddled up. And we believe also now that Philip Webb was responsible for the design of the Lich Gate by um, Churchdale House. And uh, the Lich Gate was a memorial to Edward Loring, the vicar, who'd been responsible for enlarging the church. So, in, as I'm beginning to sum up now, what I'm now saying is that we now find in this church, which the Victorian architecture, which I've tended to poo-poo and dismiss in the past, we suddenly have some of the greatest architects of the Victorian period at work here in Cobham. We've got Street, we've got Philip Webb. Um, this is the sort of transition from the high Gothic of the Victorian period through to the arts and crafts period. And lo and behold, arts and crafts, we have yet another noted architect, a man called Leonard Martin, um, who lived in Cobham. He did a, a lot of work in, in the Cobham area, um, lived over at Overby, and it was he who designed the screen behind me. Um, again, this is a, another new discovery at the London Metropolitan Archives. There is his drawing for the screen with a much smaller cross. Now, you know, it's personal, it's a question of taste. I prefer a smaller cross. This one's a bit heavy. It doesn't fit quite comfortably. Um, uh, the architect here, he, he was very much an arts and crafts man, um, not high Gothic, and the, 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 the cross is rather high Gothic. So now we've got Leonard Martin, yet another leading architect of the 19th century. So I really feel, you know, there are groups, for example, in Surrey, the Surrey Arts and Crafts group who are particularly interested in 19th century architecture. You know, we here should be very proud of St Andrews that we can display the uh, handiwork, the workmanship of these leading architects of the day. Now, I'm just going to show you very quickly, for those of you who perhaps don't know St Andrews, just two or three of our treasures. First of all, this little nativity brass, which is behind me, if you please, after I've finished talking, go and have a look. If you walk up to the high altar, it's on the wall on the right-hand right side. Just tiny little brass. It's part of a, a larger brass. It shows the nativity, and it's believed to be the only brass representation of the nativity anywhere in the country. Incredibly rare. These lovely medieval um, uh, shepherds, and there's Joseph, much larger than life, Mary, and the baby Jesus. It's a wonderful thing, and we're so grateful that actually um, was survived from the Victorian Restoration. And then just on the wall there, underneath the uh, organ pipes, there is a palimpsest brass. And if you look at that, you'll see on one side is a figure of a priest in vestments holding a chalice. This is pre-Reformation because the, the chalice has on, on it, um, I think it's the, uh, the, the name of Jesus and the fact this is, the, this is the, you know, the blood of Christ. Come the Reformation, they didn't want that, so they took the brass down and a man um, who was, we think, was the bailiff of the manor of Cobham, and eventually became lord of the manor of Cobham, he, has, he had his effigy engraved on the other side. But now you can go there, you can swivel it round, so you can see the priest, pre-Reformation, and you can see the knight in armour, uh, post-Reformation. Again, another uh, treasure for us at St Andrews. More recently, um, and I love to show this, and uh, I know Michael Elson, uh, our former church wardens here, is a great fan, Matthew Arnold, Matthew Arnold, the poet, the critic, the great scholar, a man who struggled enormously with his faith, but retained faith, and continued to worship here at Cobham. He lived in Cobham for 15 years, during which he wrote some remarkable books uh, looking at Christianity, the Bible, the New Testament, interpretation of the New Testament. He came here and worshipped. He's not buried here, he's buried at Laleham. But because of his connections here with Cobham, a plaque was put up, again, under the organ pipes, just over there. And there's a wonderful letter I found some years ago by a friend of Arnold's who happened to be in Cobham and came to church to worship and wrote rather sort of caustically to uh, another friend, there I saw Matt Arnold on his knees in prayer, almost, ha ha, this is the man who actually has lost his faith. 
but we don't think he lost his faith, do we, Michael? No. He, we don't, thank you. He was exploring faith. He was developing faith, developing perhaps some new ideas. So Matthew Arnold. And I can't resist showing you, of course, oh, a really more recent monument, which was put up only a few years ago at the back of the church, but where Paul is sitting at the sound desk. In the 17th century, one of our church wardens here was a man called Gerard Winstanley. He's my great hero. Winstanley, um, well, in brief, Winstanley, he was living at the time of the English Revolution, time of great hardship, great poverty, particularly people in London. A lot of people were starving. Winstanley believed that God spoke to him in a vision on the common near, here in, near, near Cobham and told him that he was to gather around him a group of men and women who were to go and, and take over the common land, plant crops, build houses, and live together in community and care for the poor. Now, Winstanley um, was a church warden here at Cobham, which is why we agreed to put up this um, monument to him some years ago. Uh, he, he really is a great, uh, one of our great English men. Um, sometimes he's just said to be, you know, he was a, a communist, the world's first, the, he, he led a group, they were called the Diggers, and they're called the, the first communists. But Winstanley, and I really do argue this strongly, Winstanley truly believed that God spoke to him. He had a faith. He used the language of the Bible. I dared to argue some years ago, when he was still alive, um, with um, the master of Balliol, and his name has slipped me for a moment, Christopher Hill, the great 17th century historian, who wrote a number of books about Winstanley and the Diggers. Hill was a Marxist, and he just saying, no, Winstanley used the language of the Bible. He didn't really believe. And I, in, in my cheekiness as a young person, I argued with him. And actually, he did say at the end of the day, yeah, I think probably you are right. He did have a belief. He, he you know, rightly or wrongly, was he foolish? But he believed that God spoke to him um, in this vision and told him to do this. And this particular episode, it affected the whole of the country. I won't go into it all now. You can read about it in other books. Um, but it's gone down the annals of British history. And if you go to, um, yes, if you go to Moscow today, you'll find uh, just out off Red Square a monument which has got the names of all the most famous men who've lived. Jesus Christ is actually on that monument, but so is Gerard Winstanley from Cobham. And we had no monument in Cobham, so we thought we'd put a, a plaque up at the back of the church. And we chose to go on that, this, what Winstanley wrote towards the end of his life. I have writ, I have acted, I have peace. And now I must wait to see the Spirit do his own work in the hearts of others. That's on there, and that's a challenge to all of us who come to church. You know, Winstanley did his bit, what are we doing today? How is the spirit prompting us with all the needs that are around about us in society today? A real challenge. Let it be a challenge to us today. And uh, Paynes Hill, we can't oversee church. Reminding us, people who you know, contributed to the church. And also in that corner, uh, when fortunately it's very aptly that Mike is sitting over there as well, the list of um, rectors that we've had uh, from, I'm trying to remember, the, I can't see on the screen here, Mike. Who's the earliest one? Right, and that's, what, what date is that? 1166. 1166, right, there you go. Apparently this is one of the longest known records known in the country of, um, of, of vicars and rectors. Mike sadly hasn't got his name up there. We're waiting to get a faculty and we're waiting for a little bit of money to have a new board put up there because Mike, there isn't room for Mike's name, but that will go up there eventually. So you can see this long tradition of um, Christian worship here in Com in this place. At the beginning, uh, perhaps didn't explain it terribly well, but it looks to me as though we could be saying the tower is a wee bit older than we supposed. It could have Anglo-Saxon origins. We could have it had um, a place of worship in the tower. All needs a little bit more investigation, but I think we're onto something here and we're going to work at it and uh, see what we can come up with. So, um, yeah, just to read this to you. We often think of church as being a building, 
But that is not, the really, not really the case. The church is made up of the people who as part of their lives as Christians regularly meet to worship together. Church buildings provide both a sacred place where the family of God can come together as well as being in themselves a sign of God's constant presence, love and care at the centre of the community. And as you will have seen, after a thousand years or more now, here at St Andrews, the church still stands at the heart of Cobham and continues to serve that purpose. I hope, Mike, I and others from the church here, hope you enjoyed your visit this afternoon. Hope that you've been able to enjoy something of what I've shared to you, this jewel in our crown in Cobham. And we hope that you will come back and join with us we're a very friendly family here at St Andrews. We have a very special service tomorrow. I'm sure Mike will just come and tell us about that in a moment. Um, but we meet here Sunday by Sunday. We're a friendly bunch, and we'd love to see you come and join us. I think probably... Oh, yes, no, no I do have another. Yes, yeah, sorry. Back on the screen. Thank you. Paul, right. Yeah, and... Right, yes, this is really important. Okay. So we've rewritten the guidebook because of all this. And... Uh, the right guy, which only came out a few years ago, we've had to rewrite it. And we thought, well, it is the Queen's Jubilee this year, so we've made the uh, History and Guide as a commemorative um, uh, edition for the Queen's Jubilee. Um, and they are on sale. They're being, it's being launched today. You will not be allowed to leave here without buying one. There is a cash machine, which we know, you know, which you can work over there. No, seriously, they're on the table there. They're five pounds each. We love you. And all that money is going to go back into keeping the historic fabric of the church. Now, I know I'm emphasizing the importance the church is the place where the people of God come. It's not the building, but we value this building. It has a sacredness to it because of the years the people have come here and worshipped. So we hope you'll partake in that. And, 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 the icing on the cake, we sent a copy of the guidebook to Her Majesty the Queen. And we had a letter, not quite from the Queen, but uh, can I read this to you if you can't read it up there? To all of St Andrew's Church Cobham, care of the Reverend Dr Michael Branscombe. The Queen wishes me to thank you very much for your letter and for the kind message you sent on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of Her Majesty's accession to the throne. The Queen was touched also to receive a copy of the splendid history and guide, St Andrew's Church, and to learn this new edition has been especially produced to mark Her Majesty's Platinum Jubilee. The Queen is most grateful to the Reverend Michael Branscombe and the guide's author, Dr David Taylor, for writing on behalf of you all. Your thoughtfulness is much appreciated and I'm to thank you again for the loyal sentiments you have expressed. It doesn't bear the Queen's signature, but it's one of her ladies in waiting. I'd like to think that maybe the Queen did just at least see it. It was put in front of her. We don't know. I think that's all I want to say. There could be some questions, but Michael, I know you, Mike, you've got to go off to the duck race, and I think you've got a few words for us. I'd just like to thank David on everyone's behalf, I think, for an absolutely fascinating lecture and introduction to the new discovery. So thank you, David. I do think a round of applause is in order. So I know we'll be following the uh, further inquiries on the tower with uh, the trying to find the age and when things began there. Absolutely. Maybe we need to put Surrey County Council on notice that there'll need to be a new sign for Surrey's oldest church, but yes. we'll, we'll wait on that one and let our friends at St. Mary's argue that one with us. We'll enjoy the debate. Um, David mentioned a special service here tomorrow at 10 a.m., a service of thanksgiving for 70 years of Her Majesty's reign over us. And we'll celebrate in word and song in that service tomorrow morning. You're all very, very welcome to join us. Uh, David also mentioned about the pews, and some people would like to see the pews be gone. Um, it's a major job, because you take away the pews, you take away the floor. So if anyone is really keen on that idea and has a spare couple of hundred thousand pounds, I'd be very happy to talk to you and your checkbook following the service. 
Uh, but we don't quite have the problem, do we, that they were having there in the 1860s. We're not full to bursting just yet, but maybe when we get to that point, we might address the use of the pews and chairs and other things. Um, I do have to disappear off to uh, get some ducks out of the water shortly, but it really has been an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the church. Please take your time and have a look round at some of the things David's pointed out, and I'm sure privately David would be very happy to answer any further questions. Indeed, yes. In fact, I'll take some questions down from here. Oh, sure, and then we can if you do that. Yeah. This, okay. This is still on, is it? It's that's still on. Uh, yeah. Can I hand this microphone to somebody else to help me? Greg, would you come and help me for a moment so people can hear the questions? And uh, run round with the mic while I run down to the river. Okay, thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much. David, if I remember, uh, looking in Wikipedia, uh, George Street is buried in Westminster Abbey, uh, along with uh, Charles Barry and other great Victorian architects. I may have turned that off, but I can't stop doing that. No, it's not. Just hold it a little closer. It's like an ice cream. George, George, <laughs> George, Street. George Street, um, I think, uh, altered about 150 churches, roughly, uh, in, in Britain, and he is buried in Westminster Abbey, uh, along with Charles Barry, etc., uh, if I remember what they say in Wikipedia. Yeah, yes. I mean, he was a very prolific builder and uh, restorer of churches. There was one thing I was going to say, and I will just say it now while I think of it. Um, Street was very keen on restoring churches. He was also very keen on respecting the ancient fabric. But what he did say, and this comes back to the pews, the church has got to be fit for purpose, for worship, in the day and age that you're in. I'll say no more than that, because I think that might be a little bit... I know some folk are thinking, oh, moving the pews. But, you know, it's important that we can worship God today in a meaningful way that might be a little bit different to the Tractarians. We'll all have our thoughts on it, I know. Sorry. Sorry, uh, um, Judith, yeah. Um, just occurred to me, David, um, we've got our list of benefactors, and I know a lot of churches have been looking into um, people who've given money to the church and where that money came from. I wonder whether you putting on your historian's hat have thought about that. Where the money's come from? Yeah. Yeah. That could be a bit of a leading question, Judith. <laughs> Are we thinking of the it slave trade? Be. It was meant to be, yes. <laughs> right. Well, I have actually been asked to do a little bit of work on this. There is a diocesan um, committee looking at churches which may have a connection with the slave trade and monuments. We have no monuments in this church that relate to the slave trade. But buried down there under the floor is a man called Field Marshal Lord Ligonier, who lived at Cobham Park, and there's a little plaque on the wall to him, a new plaque in there. I regret to say that Lord Ligonier gave his name to one of the most, most, most notorious slave ships. And if you ever saw the program, oh, I'm going to forget what it is now, the, the, um, about the, the slave who traced his roots back, Alex Haley, was it? Um, do you remember on television, Roots? Yeah. Uh, it features in that, this, the, the, the Lord Ligonier of the slave ship. So, and we have to be very careful with this, because I know some people get very strong feelings. Let's dig him up and you know, get rid of him, but you can't. We've got to move on with the times. We recognise, you know, what's happened. Um, we, we, we can do little about it. And whether Ligonier contributed to this, actually, there, I, I haven't got it with me, but there is a, an, a little interesting story about Ligonier being approached for money to renew the bells and uh, he dismissed when the bell rings went to see him he dismissed them and basically saying you 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 this tinkle tankle of the bells i don't want any more of it go away so he probably didn't give any money but um, yeah it's a good question thank you judith yeah um, howard david not not so much a question but uh, a comment for everyone here we have 10 blue plaques in Cobham, not one of them is for Gerard Winstanley. Those people who believe 
that there should be one, I would really counsel them to lobby locally for such a blue right. plaque. Yeah, it's a problem because we can't be absolutely sure where Gerald Winston lived in Cobham, uh, although it's fairly certain now Ashford Farm on the Chilt was a Victorian farm. There was an earlier farm there. Uh, I would say I'm 100% certain that for a short period he lived there. And, and I have a sneaky feeling that he lived for a while at what is Cedar House, a very contentious building locally at the moment, about what's going on at Cedar House. That could be a place to put a plaque, Howard. So we need to work on it. Thank you. How are we doing? Should we all right anxious to go? Oh, Stephen. Yes, please. Uh, David, thank you very much for your, for your talk. It was very, very interesting, as usual. Um, can I ask you, and I, I ought to know this from the, the church guide, but can you explain to us when the spire was added to the tower and what was the reason for that being done at the time? Right. That's... An excellent question, which I can't answer. <laughs> um, we don't, the spire, yes, I talked about this development at the tower. The spire would have been added on possibly 12th or 13th century. There is some very old um, woodwork inside the tower, um, which, uh, inside the spire, which we probably ought to have dendro dated. Um, but that would have been you know, a later addition, Stephen. And, um, I think the original tower would have been a fairly you know, short squat, um, but we can't be absolutely certain when the spire went on. As you know, we had to have it re-shingled the other year, and it's all looking very smart now. But, yeah. Can I ask a question, David? Um, the oh, great, yeah, sorry. Um, so I think you said it was Philip Webb that did the root screen behind you, yes, is that yeah. right? What about the uh, woodwork and the carving behind the altar? Right. Um, yeah, that, that is, it's fairly new <laughs> uh, in this. It's probably, I think it was added in the 1920s. Um, it was a man, I'm trying to tax my memory now, quite a well-known sculptor who, 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 who um, contributed to that. And then it was um, gilded just a few years ago. But, uh, now, a lot of what you see in that area is, in comparative terms, fairly modern. So a lot of the pews here at the 1920s, they've all got bits of, um, you know, they've got labels on them saying what date they were put in and who contributed to them. Um, often a lot of this is from the Coombe family. And of course the Coombe family, are, who are still in Cobham, um, there are pews on that side of the church which, strictly speaking, were allocated to them and their memorials are on the wall there. And on the other side of that wall in the churchyard is that horrendous, no, 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 it's enormous um, sarcophagus, um, which is where uh, Harvey Coombe, Lord Mayor of London and founder of the Coombe's Brewery, is actually buried. Um, we have mixed feelings about that large monument. Very impressive, you know, puts everything else into shade. I think you need to go to the duck race. But please, if you'd like to, you know, do feel free you can wander around. And um, just, is, is Elaine still here? No, she's not. She out. Um, if, uh, um, do you think somebody from St Andrews could just go and man the stall there with the, uh, with the books? Um, uh, Michael, could you manage? Or, or Leonard? You can't yeah, stay. I, okay. I, I can help. Great, right. can you help? Okay, the, 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 the guide books are on the table just there. And I think you could just tap on the machine if you haven't got a credit. Uh, thank you very much. C can we all say thank you to David one more time? Thanks so much, David. Oh, thank you.